Hey guys, I'm Abby Martin. Welcome to Breaking the Set. Sad news to report today. Prominent Yemeni activist Ibrahim Mothana has died at the young age of 24 of unknown causes. During his all too short yet remarkable life, Ibrahim fought for a better Yemen by leading the crusade against an illegal and horrifying U.S. drone war that has killed as many as 4,400 people to date, according to the Bureau of Investigative Journalism. His words from a 2012 op-ed in the New York Times still resonate with the exact same power and truth today. In it, he writes, quote, drone strikes are causing more and more Yemenis to hate America and join radical militants. They are not driven by ideology, but rather by a sense of revenge and despair. Rather than winning the hearts and minds of Yemeni civilians, America is alienating them by killing their relatives and friends. Unfortunately, before Ibrahim has even had the chance to be buried, the U.S. launched a brand new drone strike on Pakistan today that's killed at least six people. Rest in peace, Ibrahim, and know that your words and actions have shed a glaring light on a policy of covert global murder. Tired yet of America's sick game of drones? Then join me and let's break the set. The war drums are beating loudly in the halls of Congress while leading Obama officials continue to try to convince the House to vote as the Senate Foreign Relations Committee did for military strikes on Syria. If Congress votes no, the world will be watching to see if Obama has the audacity to take unilateral action without even the support of his own government. Now, amidst the sea of propaganda and warmongering, there's one politician in the UK that has been a vocal opponent to this new war. His name is George Galloway, and he's a founding member of the Respect Party in Parliament. Well, earlier I spoke with him about the repercussions a military strike could have on the region as well as the rest of the world. Check it out. Sadly, my birthday wish doesn't look like it's going to come true. Uh, let's talk about the latest on Syria. There's talk of using fighter jets and training rebel forces on the ground instead of just arming them. Why is it that the U.S. is aligning itself with the same terrorist organization it claims to be fighting in the war on terror, George? Indeed, and the uh, relatives of those who were lost on 9-11, who were cruelly murdered in their thousands, must be asking themselves how their country ended up in bed with Al-Qaeda. And not just in bed, but arming them to the teeth, acting as their air force and their armorer and their financier. It is one of the most grotesque about faces in all history. And the people of the United States overwhelmingly oppose it, but their political leaders appear to be ready to endorse it. Behind me is the British Parliament. Normally a lapdog, a poodle of American political leaders, but just the other week we revolted and stood up and said this far and no further, no war in Syria. And that too reflected overwhelmingly the popular opinion in the country. But uh, the United States has not been stopped even by the failure of the British to show up in another shooting war. Yeah, I mean, the hypocrisy is running really strong, George, and I was surprised to see the criminal conspirators from doctoring the Iraq intelligence in the British Parliament vote no. It made me really happy. Uh, a lot of um, proud, proud moments there from the world leaders. Uh, and as we've seen unfold in Iraq post-occupation, there's now a complete civil war rife with sectarian violence. It's a complete disaster. Is it that the decision makers don't understand the religion and the region, or is it that they just don't care? I don't think religion has anything to do uh, with it. Religions uh, believe in the prophets, peace be upon them. Our leaders believe in the prophets and how to get a bigger piece of them. It's about domination. It's about Israel. It's about the projection of American power and the terrifying of potential rivals and competitors. In this case, principally Russia and China. I don't think that they're acting very terrified at this moment. And so the United States is in for a contested war in Syria. And that's why the congressional representatives would be wise to heed the lesson of Iraq. The United States lost thousands of soldiers and tens of thousands of wounded soldiers, maimed many of them forever, and many of them committing suicide or murdering people when they got home in the decades since. And many of them, of course, ending up on the streets homeless and jobless. And the congressional representatives ought to beware that what will begin with a flurry of tomahawk missiles and how obscene is it 
that the United States calls its killing weapons uh, after the people that it annihilated in order to occupy the country in the first place. It will start with a flurry of Tomahawk cruise missiles, but it will end in a shooting war on the ground and with an occupation and one in a country with 23 religious and ethnic groups within it and in the most combustible possible piece of territory on the earth. The Syrian people will fight them back. Syria's friends will fight them back. And they will fight them back everywhere, not just in Syria. You know, I, I say it, it's like we're killing Syrians to show the Syrian regime that killing Syrians is wrong. I just can't wrap my head around it, George, and the stakes are very high, as you just and, outlined. Uh, well, well, well put, put, put this one in your mind, Abby. The next time you see President Obama happy clapping in a Christian church, the Al-Qaeda sacked a town called Ma'lula, which I know very well in Syria, where the people are the last people on earth still conducting their Christian services in the language of Jesus, in Aramaic. It is one of the most serene and beautiful and peaceful places on the earth, filled with Christian churches and monasteries and nunneries. And the people there were slaughtered over the last four days, literally slaughtered, with their necks, uh, their throats cut, their heads sawn off. The Christian churches are on fire at the hands of Al-Qaeda. That's Al-Qaeda, paid for and armed by the United States of America. It makes me physically ill to hear that, George, that we're actually bombing the cradle of civilization, the birthplace of humanity. We're not respecting the birthplace of Christianity in, in terms of these leaders who claim that they're Christian. George, we've both been reporting yes, that... Never done. they're never done telling us. <laughs> yeah, they're exactly. never done telling us how Christian they are. Exactly. They wear it on their sleeves. <laughs> well... You know, we've both been reporting that a British firm allegedly sold nerve gas to Syria. Let's wrap our minds around this one. Ten months after the Civil War yeah. broke out, also the Digital Journal is reporting that yeah. the Saudi intelligence gave the rebels chemical weapons. Why are these insanely contradictory facts not reported on in such a serious climate of debate? Well, we can't, we can't even get them in the British uh, so-called mainstream media. The fact that Carla Ponte, the United Nations rapporteur, in May of this year, just a few months ago, at the beginning of the summer, this summer, reported that the Syrian rebels had used the very sarin nerve gas that they're telling us now must have been used by the Assad regime. The uh, Turkish authorities captured a group of Syrian rebels making their way across the Turkish border, bearing loads of this very sarin gas. They're trying to pretend that you have to be a state to have your hands on sarin gas. But less than 20 years ago, a group of Shinto obscurantists living on the lip of Mount Fuji in Tokyo uh, used this gas in the Tokyo underground, killing and maiming a very large number of people in the name of Shinto. So any group, any gang, any mob of uh, gangsters can get their hands on sarin gas. And I am absolutely convinced that the Russian President Putin is correct. I don't believe he'd be continuing to insist upon it if he had any doubt about it. That this weaponry either was an accidental discharge from the rebels' uh, stockpile or was a deliberate provocation to bring in the Western powers into this war, which of course, as soon as President Obama drew a red line on this issue, he was openly inviting. So uh, that's one point. But the other point is this. Behind me in the British Parliament in the 1920s, Winston Churchill said this, upon dropping chemical weapons on Iraqi Kurds. He said, and I quote, I don't understand what all the fuss is about, dropping gas on rebel tribesmen in the north of Iraq. We have been dropping chemical weapons on people of the so-called third world for the best part of a century. The United States dropped an ocean of chemical weapons on the people of Vietnam, and their children are still being born today deformed as a result of it. The United States used chemical weapons against the Iraqi resistance in Fallujah just a decade ago. And Israel used chemical weapons against the Palestinian people in Gaza just three years ago. The hypocrisy 
is monumental. It's of Everestian proportion. It's astounding, but the media George, simply astounding. will not report this. It's astounding. And yeah, I mean, the toxic legacy in Fallujah is even astronomically more than Hiroshima, shockingly enough. And as you said on the floor of Parliament, you said, would Assad be insane enough to launch a chemical weapons attack on the exact same day that UN weapons inspectors arrive in Damascus? And if he is that insane, what's going to happen when we do launch Tomahawk cruise missiles over the region? George, I wanted to move on to Israel. You mentioned Israel before. Right now, they are lobbying super hard on the Hill right now. APEC is going out on a full on lobbying campaign for serious strikes. How much of this war is about Israel? Well, it's a full court press by the Israel lobby uh, in Britain and in the United States. They failed in Britain. They appear to be succeeding in the United States. And at least it unmasks a pretty monumental conspiracy. John Kerry told the world that the Arab regimes in the Persian Gulf are going to pay for this war. Israel is lobbying hard for the war and getting ready for it. So we have the most grotesque coalition ever assembled in history. Al-Qaeda, the United States, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and other Persian Gulf states. Who could have made such a scenario up? But uh, be careful what you wish for, because I'm certain that Israel will be in this war big time and very quickly, because I'm certain that Syria and its friends will immediately turn the war, take the war to Israel in the first hours after the United States bombardment of Syria begins. Israel presumably will uh, retaliate and enter the war. We'll then have an Arab-Israeli war fought on top of the oil fields and uh, in the midst of one of the worst depressions that the developed world has ever seen. So look out for the oil price rocketing, perhaps quadrupling as it did in 1973-74. Look out for the Straits of Hormuz being blocked and no oil moving out of the Gulf to the world. Look out for the Suez Canal uh, being uh, blocked and attacked. Look out for war throughout the world. There's going to be murder and mayhem throughout the world. That's what happy, clappy Mr. Christian, Barack Obama, who just the other day was hailing the memory of Martin Luther King, is about to visit on the world. Well, it's a disgrace. And as Upton Sinclair said, you know, when fascism comes to America, it's going to be wrapped in an American flag and um, on a Bible, uh, George. I wanted to talk about your documentary. Uh, you just started a Kickstarter for The Killing of Tony Blair. What is this movie? And you're kind of a big deal. I'm sure you could have gotten a lot of corporate sponsors to make this film. Why go the grassroots route? Well, we wanted uh, democratic uh, funding of the film. I could have gone to a few rich people and raised a lot of money, but I decided to go to thousands of not rich people uh, and raise a little money from each of them. And we reached our Kickstarter, 50,000 pound, that's about, what, $70,000 uh, Kickstarter fund uh, limit. We reached it in less than one week. So we have just under 30 days to go to raise the money that we need to make the equivalent of Fahrenheit 9-11. We intend, our goal is ambitious. We intend to put Tony Blair, the Middle East peace envoy, that's going well, isn't it, Tony, in prison for crimes against humanity, for war crimes. He murdered the Labour Party. He helped murder a million people in Iraq. He has caused uncountable deaths in Afghanistan and in Lebanon and in Palestine and in Syria where he's egging uh, Obama on for a new war. He sold his soul to the devil and sold his services to some of the most devilish corporations and dictatorships in the world. It's quite a lot of meat for a documentary. <laughs> Michael Moore, watch out. I'm coming to take your laurels. <laughs> so Tony Blair has made a killing, killing a massive amount of people, and he, like many of his criminal yes. cohorts here in the U.S., sit free while people who stand up to the system rot in prison. Seems like the system's completely upside down. We have about a minute left, George, but you are an anomaly. You've been working within the system for years. You founded the Respect Party in Parliament. How is it that you've not been pushed out of office yet? Well, I've been elected six times to Parliament. Uh, I know I'm older than I look. Uh, I was a very young man when I entered Parliament. It was a Parliament worth being a member of them. I'm not uh, sure if it is today, uh, but I have stood uh, firm with my principles and I uh, share with Mr. Churchill the distinction of being the only two men in British history to be elected 
uh, six times in two countries in four different constituencies. But that's where the similarity between me and Winston Churchill ends. Well, clearly the people want to hear what you have to hear. They want you to stand up for the voiceless. Thank you so much. You're here to me. George Galloway, Respect Pleasure. Party. Pleasure. Thank you so much. Happy birthday, Abby. <laughs> Still ahead, activists gathered in front of the White House to call attention to the force feeding happening to get more detainees. Manuel Rapolo was there, and he'll bring us the latest. Guantanamo Bay. For many, it's out of sight, out of mind. But what about the dozens of innocent men being held indefinitely who have already been cleared for release years ago? Well, lately, the corporate media has been enjoying a total blackout on any news about Gitmo. But one group of activists have been consistently calling attention to the issue by holding rallies here in Washington, D.C. every week, demanding that the prison be closed. Breaking the set producer, Manuel Rapolo, got a chance to attend one of these unique demonstrations outside of the White House. Check it out. Demonstrators outside the White House are once again calling on the Obama administration to close Guantanamo Bay prison and end the practice of force-feeding detainees that are currently on a hunger strike. The hunger strike at Guantanamo has now far surpassed 200 days. Demonstrators are here again trying to raise awareness about the plight of these prisoners. Human rights groups as well as the UN have declared the practice of force feeding a form of torture, a point being made by activist Andres Contreras, who has undergone a 61 day fast in solidarity with Gitmo prisoners. I've been fasting for 61 days on water only, some calories through coconut water, but mostly water and vitamins and minerals and salt. And I've lost 52 pounds. As part of the demonstration, Contreras underwent a nasogastric feeding right in front of the White House. Oh. This is all being done completely oh. against his will. It's an outrage. This procedure is similar to what hunger strikers at Guantanamo are forced to undergo every day and serves to highlight what life is really like for residents of the world's most controversial detention facility. What I went through today, I can't tell you. I thought it was going to be so much simpler. It was excruciating. It was absolute agony at every step of the way. I didn't know it was going to hurt so much that when he pulled it out, it was horrible. And when he put it in, it was every step was brutal. And for, and for that to happen twice a day to these prisoners is unimaginable to me. Closing Guantanamo was a main pillar of Obama's 2008 campaign, yet the facility remains open. And at nearly half a billion dollars a year to operate, Gitmo is the most expensive prison on the planet. It's a fact not overlooked by Colonel Morris Davis, former chief prosecutor at the detention camp. I've seen different figures, but something in excess of $2 million per person per year, which federal prison here costs in the thirty to $35,000 per year range. So it's just a huge, huge waste of millions and millions of dollars that's unnecessary. President Obama blames Congress for standing in the way of closing Guantanamo. Others would argue that it's the administration that lacks the political will to do so. But while finger pointing continues to supersede action, dozens of men who wait for freedom wait for a day that frankly may never come. Manuel Rompolo, RT, the White House. Joining me now to talk more about Guantanamo Bay and the force feeding of these prisoners, BTS producer Manuel Rapolo. Hi, Abby. Hey, man. Um, so, yes, all this finger pointing is going on. Awesome job, by the way. But isn't it true that Obama can use national security waiver to release the prisoners? Now, right. today. No. <laughs> uh, ab absolutely. Um, and th there's already been prisoners that have been released. Two Algerian prisoners were recent re recently released over the last uh, couple of weeks. President Obama can absolutely use the national security waiver. Uh, the only problem would be that he would have to do that 160 something times for each one of the of the prisoners at the very least he'd have to do it 90 something times for the prisoners that we know are innocent Who that cares? have already been cleared for release no that's great so why isn't he doing it 166 times absolutely at least for the 55 prisoners have been released not only not, not, on, not only that president obama has an ability to do so so does congress congress can can act and come up with a resolution to to find a way to get rid of to, to 
get these prisoners back to their home countries. There is a lack of political will. There is a lack of public support for that sort of initiative. And there's an absolute lack of media attention on, on the matter, which means that it's, it might as well be an irrelevant issue for the American people because it's not on their radar. And that's the biggest problem that we have. That's un really unfortunate. Um, let's talk about this horrific force feeding procedure. It was really hard to watch that guy. And, you know, Manny, we've covered this before on the show, and most deaf, the actor um, and um, rapper, went through the practice on camera, and people were like, oh, he's an actor, he's not really being heard. I mean, this was is your friend acting this, here? This is absolutely hard to watch, especially knowing Andres. Um, I've worked with him in activist circles in the past. Uh, he is, he lost, first of all, he lost 50 pounds yeah. off of this hunger strike. What he's undergoing, Ugh. what you're seeing right now, uh, they're using a six millimeter tube. What they use on, on Guantanamo prisoners is a 10 millimeter tube. So it's far more harsh. And that doctor that you see next to him, I had a chance to speak to him for a while. And what he was explaining is that this doesn't have to be torture. The, uh, using uh, using a, a nasogastric tube for feeding uh, is, is standard practice for people, you know, when, when you need to be fed. If this is not, if you are not complying to this, if you're not doing this willingly, that is torture. That is a horrible thing to do to a person. If the tube goes in too far, it can, it can pierce the brain. If it goes in too deep, it can pierce a lung. Uh, you can drown. You can get an infection from this. There are a number of risks associated when it's done correctly, let alone when somebody is fighting to yeah. not have this done and to we them. Know and, this that is they are and they're doing it twice a day to these people. Twice, and, and a, twice day. a day, every twice. day. To half of these prisoners at Guantanamo Bay, and, I just and the can't UN stress enough, yeah, that the, the UN has already declared it as torture for force feeding the prisoners. Manny, I can't help but notice that you're wearing this little orange ribbon right here. What does that represent? Sure. Um, one of the points that Colonel Davis was making uh, this afternoon at the at the rally was, first of all, there was absolutely zero corporate media presence at um, the at the rally. I'm shocked. Oh wow! <laughs> surprise, surprise. No. Um, as journalists, as activists, it is not our job to tell people that they have to care from a humanitarian standpoint. They don't have to care about the illegality and unconstitutionality of, of Guantanamo. But when we are, as taxpayers, paying $2.7 million per prisoner per year, that's almost $5 billion a year that we're paying for this facility that is the most expensive prison facility on the planet, then we have to care then we have to care as taxpayers, as American citizens. That's because what these, we're sponsoring this. That's what these Literally. ribbons are for. There are 2.7 million ribbons that are being handed out to remind you that is $2.7 million per prisoner. Um, that's outrageous. That's outrageous. From a fiscal standpoint, Americans should be outraged alone. It is really outrageous, Manny. Thank you for breaking that down because I don't think a lot of people really realize that they are sponsoring this kind of torture and, and, and you know, injustice, really. And, you know, I just don't understand, and I have to make this point, it's that the U.S. government's trusting the Yemeni government to carry out drone strikes weekly, um, it seems. But they cannot trust the government to take prisoners from Gitmo because they say, oh, they're, they're going to be terrorists. We can't trust to release them. However, many people have been released from Guantanamo Bay in the past, and they are just living out normal lives. They just want the chance to have a free life and not be detained indefinitely. Absolutely. And that's one of the really sad aspects of this is because I feel like the, uh, the vast majority of Americans are under the impression still, even after 10 years that this facility has been open, that these are the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. These guys are all terrorists. They deserve to be there. They deserve uh, to be tortured or whatever. First of all, yes, these people are being tortured. Secondly, you, half of these men are innocent. There are no charges against them. They, uh, they have been, for the most part, being cleared for release, and the vast majority of them are Yemeni. And the problem is that uh, there are no countries that are, that are currently wanting to host these, uh, these prisoners because there's so much red tape associated with that here in the United States. The United States promised the Yemeni people that there would be facilities, infrastructure there to help former Guantanamo inmates reassimilate into, into society. That infrastructure has yet to, to exist. It's not there. We have covered this on the show in the past. We've had activists, we've had journalists that have traveled to Yemen that have explained to us what it's like for, for people that, that, that are around these drone bombings and all these horrible things that are happening in Yemen. And on top of that, there's, there's, all, there's the Guantanamo aspect, that these men will never uh, return and will never see their families, and that's, it's, it's heartbreaking. Right, and the PTSD of just these communities being terrorized on a daily basis, and also the people who are let out of prison being assimilated back into society after being indefinitely detained for so long, Manny. Um, 
it's just it's it's a travesty and also it's not so black and white where it's either you're guilty or not there's layers of you know association with al qaeda there it's almost like a gang force it's not like they're in al qaeda and they're terrorists so it's just such a convoluted issue thank you for breaking it down and shedding some light on this really important humanitarian crisis that we need to hold our politicians accountable for manuel rapolo appreciate it thanks abby happy birthday thank you so if you guys are wondering what I'm doing when I'm not on air, check me out on Twitter at Abby Martin. If you like what you see, you can follow me there. You'll find all of my tweets linking to segments from the show as well as random thoughts I had throughout the day. And also, please help us get the show trending on the Twitter sphere. Occasionally, I'll throw out some hashtags we can get, but only with your help. So head to Twitter. Check me out at Abby Martin. That's all for this week, you guys. Thank you so much for all of your support for our first week back and for all the birthday love. If I could have one wish for this day, it's that my country's people stand up to the government and its corporate oligarchs to demand the restoration of justice, freedom, and no new wars.